How's your family doing? Yeah, they're doing well. My brother says hi. I haven't seen it. He's like one of the only people that doesn't have social media, so I never know what's going on with him. Yeah, no, he doesn't do any of that stuff. Yeah. Yep. He's doing well. He's out in Pittsburgh. He's in Cobby's in Pittsburgh? Yeah. Ah. I thought and he was, uh, he was in California for a while, right? He was, and then he was back on the East Coast, and you know, but now he's in Pittsburgh, yeah. Nice, nice. And you're in uh, you're in Texas, right? Yep, Houston. Nice, nice. How long have you been over there? Um, since I got picked up for this, so August of 2017. Nice. You like it? I feel like everybody's moving to either Florida or Texas. Yeah, my parents are in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> nice. How are they? It's great. It's beautiful out here right now, weather-wise. Nice. Yeah, I'm in Chicago right now. It's Gloomy. I don't know why I went from New York to Chicago. I should have done something warmer, but what are you going to do, right? Yeah. Cool. Well, I have a bunch of questions here. I won't take up uh, too much of your time. I'll try and get as many of them in as I possibly can. But uh, I got a bunch of stuff from very old people and very young people, which is very interesting. There's like no in between. Like a lot of kids and a lot of people are uh, very interested in what you do. So uh, I'll just start to go through. Um, is she recording? Yeah, it looks like it's recording. All right, awesome. So when this gets cut up, I'll just start out with uh, my guest today is Jasmine Mogbelli. She is a battle-tested Marine, a Long Island native, which is the most important thing, and uh, of course, the newest member of uh, NASA, uh, astronaut, and I have a whole bunch of um, things here I want to ask her and dig deep into. I have known family for pretty much my whole life, so I think it's pretty awesome to uh, to watch all of the things that you're getting, and uh, it's cool because a lot of the other people, some of my friends that were in the military or some of my friends that are at the science or just people in general have been sending me articles about you that had no idea <laughs> that you were from Long Island, that I knew you, and like my mom will pass them on and she'll be like, did you see that this person posted about Jasmine? Do they even know? I'm like, no, no. So this will be really cool. So um, one of the biggest things was, uh, you know, being... I know you've always been uh, disciplined. I know your family's always, I remember being very young and you guys always had to drink your milk and do your homework and your parents always <laughs> had like very good habits for keeping you guys good and smart and healthy and giving you um, good discipline there. I never heard you talking about being uh, an astronaut or anything like that, that young. Who or what was it that inspired you or made you interested in going into space or, or going down that path of being an astronaut? Yeah, it first started uh, at Lennox, actually, in uh, sixth grade. I did a book report on Valentina Tereshkova, the first first woman in space cosmonaut. And we had to dress up, like, you know, and pretend we were that person for the day in school. And so, you know, my mom helped me make this uh, little astronaut costume that uh, I look back at it now. I saw a picture of it, and it, it looked more like a beekeeper costume, but I thought it was real cool at the time. And um, that so that was when I started thinking that would be really cool. Um, but then, I, you know, at that point, you're in sixth grade. So you just think, hey, this sounds like a really adventurous, exciting thing to do. But then as I got older, I started looking into it more and um, started finding out more about it. I went to space camp, I think in ninth grade, and then went to see my first shuttle launch in 2006. And so it's kind of something that just grew as I got older. I think it's awesome because one of the, the reasons I started a podcast was I like talking to people that kept doing something that when they – everybody grows up in elementary school saying I want to be you know a football player or a TV star or an astronaut, but nobody follows through with it. They either get sidetracked by just, I guess, losing focus of their goals or having people tell them that their goals are unrealistic. So I think it's awesome that you did something that at some point I would say every kid – thinks about wanting to be an astronaut and go into space, but you you actually did it. And uh, I think that's a, a really cool thing, but I know you actually started with the military first, right? Obviously you were in Marine Corps. Yeah, and I'm still in the Marine Corps. I'm still active duty in the Marine Corps. So um, the Marine Corps has uh, allowed NASA to have me uh, for now, but yeah, so I joined the Marine Corps basically straight out of college in my, between my junior and senior years of college. I went through uh, officer candidate school. And so right after I graduated from my undergrad, I got commissioned, went through the basic school for the Marine Corps and then flight school, became a Cobra pilot, 
I did uh, three deployments as a Cobra pilot, got picked up for test pilot school while I was on the third one. So I think I got back from deployment, had a week to move and then started test pilot school, did a developmental test tour out in China Lake, California, and then an operational test tour out in Yuma. And when I was in Yuma is when I got picked up for the astronaut program. That's pretty awesome. What was your initial reaction you were getting from your friends and family when you told them that you wanted to be a fighter pilot in the Marine Corps? Or actually for both, I'd like to hear their, what, what was the what was the path? Was it that you knew that the Marine Corps was gonna get you closer to NASA or was NASA something that came from you going to the Marine Corps? I think I was just kind of lucky in that, um, you know, that long term term goal of being an astronaut. Also, the steps to get there just aligned with what I naturally wanted to do. The military, I think, always appealed to me from a pretty young age. Um, you know, both my uh, grandfathers on my mother's and father's side were in the military in Iran. Um, and I know my my mom's dad, when he came to visit, you know, he was a an admiral in the Iranian Navy and he'd tell me stories as a kid and and um, so I always thought that was really cool and then as I got older and started looking into it um, military aviation I think flying and aviation and aerospace were always interesting to me too and so everything just kind of lined up where the things I liked also helped set me up for NASA well but um, I don't think I ever, I don't think I did them ever just to get to this end state because I think you always know becoming an astronaut. I mean, I feel incredibly lucky to be here. And uh, while there was a lot of hard work that went into it, there's there's also a bit of luck there. And so, you know, doing something just for that, you know, wasn't reasonable, but um, it just did end up helping set me up. That's incredible. And I know uh, I've gotten tons of messages from people and everybody in Baldwin is super proud of you. I talked to uh, the Coopers and you know the O'Connells and I still see all the familiar faces around. So I'm sure everybody's going to be excited to hear that you're doing good. And they're all, all the Linux moms are probably passing around articles online and stuff about Jasmine. So I think it's really cool. The mothers of Baldwin as we know them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good old Baldwin. Um, but so were they on board with you for going into the military at first? Because I know obviously you said you had family in there, but sometimes they don't want them to go down that path or, or on the other side of it. Did you get resistance because a lot of the the strong females that I know are, are even more excited because you're really in a more male dominated type of occupation that were you getting some resistance on that from being a female or just from being a kid or was, was it supportive right off the bat? Um. I think honestly, there there was a little bit of resistance from my parents, but that was probably mainly because so my freshman year of college was September when September 11th happened. So I had just gotten to college and been there about a month and I ended up going to MIT for college, but I came really close to going to the Naval Academy. And so I already knew I was interested in going to the military, but uh, MIT just was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. So I did end up going there. And, you know, then September 11th happened. So by the time I actually signed up to join the Marine Corps and went to officer candidate school, we were now in a post September 11th world and and people were deployed in, in some real serious situations. So I think that was where the resistance from my parents came. But once I joined and the decision was final they were 100 percent supportive and have been ever since that's really cool have you seen that that's uh a big thing for you just overall the having the support of the people at home has really helped you keep pushing towards your goals because i, I told everybody you know with the stuff that i do in real estate and all the other things and the guys that i know that are fighters not necessarily coming from a good financial background but coming from a good support system at home, to me, I think is one of the most valuable things somebody can have, especially the more, you know, quote unquote, crazy your career goals are, your, your personal goals, the more important it is to have somebody that's kind of in your corner. And obviously, there's nobody better to have in your corner than your mom and dad supporting you because they, they're always going to look out for you. But how how helpful was it for you on the days that you were down or the times that you were maybe having a tough time 
being able to lean on them and have that support at home from your family. Oh, I agree completely. It is huge just because my parents have always been very influential for me. And I can't remember a single time in my life where they questioned that I could do something. And I think to me, like the, the power of the mind is incredible. And if you believe you can do something, you can do some amazing things. And so with my parents never once questioning me, that gave me belief in myself that there were definitely times where I failed along the way, but I never once questioned that I would, that I would uh, meet the uh, end goal just because I had that belief in myself. And I think a large part of that came from my parents. Um, and so, and I tell people, and your parents, you know, you don't get to choose your parents, but I tell people you do get to choose your friends. And I think I also had, had incredible friends throughout my life that similarly always kind of gave me that support and backing. You know, they challenge me and, and test me, but always supported me and celebrated my successes and, and likewise uh, with me for them. So it, I think it's huge having that support. I agree too. I think it's cool. I don't come across as many people that when I talk to them and they ask about my friends that I grew up with and like, I still talk to them pretty much every day. I hang out with like Mark and Sean and Andrew and Neil yeah. and you know, Kavi as much, but uh, I know you guys had that too, where you're hanging out with Chrissy and, and everybody. And I don't find that a lot of people still have their core friends from elementary school. Now that we're like in 35 and 40 years old. Um, I don't know. I just think that says a lot about where we grew up and how we grew up and the way our parents all still talk and we all talk. And now a lot of like our friends, kids are all starting to hang out together. And I think that's a, a really cool thing. I am very interested to watch how when our kids are starting to grow up, like I think Sean, Sean and Mars kids are like four and five. Obviously, Neil's yeah. kids are older. But, you know, now some of our groups, it's like, well, your Uncle Mark is a rock star and your Uncle Sean's a rock star. Your Uncle Neil has his own business and your Aunt Jasmine is literally an astronaut. I think that that's going to create such a, an awesome plat platform for their kids growing up and having that same belief system of like, well, why can't I be an astronaut and Jasmine? an astronaut why can't i be a rock star uncle mark's a rock star and like you said that belief in just being surrounded by people because i don't remember growing up and being able to look around and see all these successful people who did something different than really work a nine to five and everybody talked about wanting to do it but now there's a whole generation coming up that are like a degree apart that can i really feel do anything and have proof in people that they know that they can reach out to on things like social media to be able to do that so you know, having said that, a lot of people have asked me to ask you, how do you feel about the position you're in now? Do you feel like a role model? Do you have a lot of kids and a lot of women reaching out to help you empower and inspire them? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's always a little weird to think of yourself as a role model because, you know, I know all my flaws. I know all my missteps and, and that. But I, you know, I'm aware enough to recognize that, I, that people do look look up to me as a role model. And so um, and I've you know, I hope I can be a role model for both, you know, boys and girls, but definitely uh, I have a lot of parents of young kids that are interested in space reaching out to me and say, hey, you know, we want our daughter to to know someone that, that has done this and, and get advice from them. And so I think I can recognize that people do look at me as a role model. And so um, you know, I, I try to be the best version of myself uh, to, to set a good example for them. But um, I think it is important to recognize that uh, it's always easier to, to look at someone that is, is similar to you in some way. And so it is easier, I think, sometimes for girls to connect with women. And um, so, yeah, I recognize that that's important. I think that's awesome. And uh, I definitely think you're a role model. And I think you doing all the stuff you did is incredible for for everybody regardless of who they are because again i have people sending me questions for you from five years old to 75 years old so you're inspiring yes. people all over which is pretty cool um but for you now who who are your role models who are the people that inspire you who are the people that you look up to and would like to model yourself after yeah i mean i've i've talked about my parents a bit they've definitely been role models for me um growing up talk about hardworking um, and then not, not just the hard work but also kind of 
I think they exemplified service to others and um, compassion and things like that. I think my mom was a great role model of being confident and standing up for yourself. My brother, you know, I mean, we, we've got that sibling rivalry, of course, but at the end of the day, um, I think my brother, you know, there's that age where peer pressure becomes a really critical influence and it can it can be a positive thing or it, it can potentially be a negative thing. And I think one thing that was really important about my brother was I feel like he taught me that it was cool to be smart. It was cool to be hardworking. It was cool to be successful. It was not cool to be lazy. It was not cool to be dumb, you know, so that was, I think, really important. I've had so many good teachers. I mean, going back from, I still keep in touch with some of our elementary school teachers and all the way through high school, some incredible teachers. And like you said, we were very lucky. We went to school. We had a great community, a very diverse community. I thought our public school system was great going through it. Um, and then throughout the Marine Corps, I've had a lot of great mentors as well. So a lot, a lot of people uh, that have been very influential in a positive way. That's awesome. And I remember your brother's always been one of the smartest guys I've ever met. He was even at a young age was always very by the book and very disciplined. And your parents were always very nice to me. I used to love coming over and playing with Booch. <laughs> yeah, Booch. <laughs> Booch dogs. So a couple other things is you started touching on the mindset part of that. And to me, that I think is the most critical. Um, every person I talk to that is successful has self-doubt, has obstacles. Um, it sounds like you've been very strong-minded for a long time and that kind of came generationally down through your family. And obviously you don't get through the Marine Corps by being like that and you don't hit a goal like being an astronaut by being like that. But what are some of the things you do when you are having a tough time or you are having some self-doubt or you're hitting obstacles on the road to, to keep yourself with your eye on the prize and you know live to fight another day, so to speak? Yeah, I think... One one thing that uh, has always I remember going through officer candidate school. It's like this this love hate relationship. It's an incredible experience. It's a once in a lifetime experience, but it it was also incredibly mentally and physically challenging. You know, you, you're constantly being watched and evaluated and yelled at, and it, you're tired, you're hungry, and I just remember like constantly being like, if that person can do it, I can do it. So. That's one of those things that uh, I, I do say a lot, like, okay, if, if someone else can do it, I can do it too. You know, there's no reason someone else can do it and I can't do it. Um, and then for things um, where, you know, there are times at MIT, I my first test that I took at MIT, and this is in math, which is a subject I thought I was good at before getting to MIT, I got a 24 out of 100 and I was like, looking around like maybe everyone failed no people had 80s and 90s so talk about self-doubt i was like i've got four more years to go and uh i don't want to fail out of college so i just try to like see what 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 can i do differently to get me success who can i get help from you know i, I think that's something sometimes People are a little too proud to get help. There, there are people there. Help them when you can, and and get help when you need it. And seek out advice from from different mentors, your friends, whoever it is. Um, but just try different things until until something works. And just think about. I think something I always ask myself is: Is this important enough to me to put in the effort to do it? Because things that are hard are gonna take effort. And there are times when you go, nope, that's not a priority for me. So that's not where I'm gonna spend my effort. But then there are times you go, yeah, I don't care how much effort it takes, I'm gonna put it in for this because it's important for me. I love that. And have, have you always been like that with your goals and the things that you want to achieve? I, I, think, I've, I think I've always, how do I put this, had a, a good sense of, you know, the consequences of what I do can impact um, can impact the outcome and impact my life path. And so, you know, whether I put a little too much pressure on myself at times, there, you know, there was always that pressure if I didn't want to 
close the door to certain things to um, to achieve a certain level that I thought was necessary to, to get there. I don't know. I, I think I, I think I've always been a bit of a perfectionist too, for better or worse. But um, it's, it's helpful at times and bad at times. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. It's uh, it's a double edged sword, but I I think most successful people are probably their toughest critics and, and striving for that is is probably why you're where you're at today. Yeah. So a couple of the questions that came in, uh, you talked about um, uh, math and science. Have those always been things that you liked and have you always been good at them? Yeah, I did always like math and science. I think partially because I was good at them naturally. Um, so I, I'll be honest, I was the kind of kid that loved school growing up. Like, not not to say I wasn't excited when summer came for for the break and to to hang out outside and stuff. But but I was genuinely excited to go back to school every year. Um, and and so it wasn't just math and science I liked. I liked English. I liked history. I just wasn't quite as good at them as I was uh, um, at math and science. But yeah, I, as as long as I can remember, I've I've liked math and science, especially physics. I always thought, yeah, I always enjoyed physics, so, yeah. That's cool, and I know that you said uh, Kave helped you see that it was actually cool to be intelligent. If any kids listen to this, the one thing that I wish, wish that they would understand is that it really is, like, now that I'm you know, almost 40, one of the things that I am most impressed by or like in awe of is, is people's intelligence and just, I can't read enough. I can't research enough. Like during this lockdown, I'm up early. I'm staying late, just trying to get that. And I think that that's one of the most impressive characteristics somebody can have is just to be intelligent and to have that knowledge. So, you know, I, when you're younger, not everybody appreciates that, but I, I couldn't agree more that I just think that it's, I think intelligence is just fascinating to me. Yeah. You don't necessarily get that sense growing up sometimes that's easily, it's easily kind of lost at, at that you know, especially the junior high, high school age, it can easily be lost. But um, I think once most people get older, people definitely value that in other, in other individuals. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I start to crave it. It's almost like, like vegetables. When I stopped eating uh, fast food every day, I started craving vegetables. When I, when I stopped watching Netflix every day and I started reading books and getting on webinars and you just, you kind of want more and more and then you see all this different stuff out there and I just think that's awesome. So another couple questions that came in uh, and by the way, thank you for sending the, uh, the autograph pictures for Dan and Hayden. They absolutely oh, love yeah. them. No problem. They had a uh, question. So Dan has a question. She's the one who wants to work for NASA, but doesn't want to go to space. She wants to know what your favorite planet is. Her favorite planet is Jupiter. Jupiter. That's a good one. Lots of, lots of moons. Uh, very big. Um, you know, I ha I have to say Earth. I just <laughs> it's it's tough to beat, right? We're yes, though that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it. I mean, just even looking at the, you know, I obviously haven't been to space yet, so I haven't been able to look back at it. But every single astronaut I've talked to that has come back has said that was just like looking back at Earth was so impactful for them and just kind of change them like at their core. And so, uh, and just the thought that, that that's where we all live, like on this planet Earth and it's so beautiful and we have to take care of it. So I, I gotta go with Earth. That's a great answer. On the on the flip side of that, what is your favorite constellation is what uh, Hayden Marshall wanted to know. You know, that's a really funny question because I actually, um, I, I get, um, get a lot of flack for not being very good with my constellations. I, I'm gonna, you know, I would say the Big Dipper because it's the one I can actually find. But you know, where we grew up, it was kind of hard to see the stars because there was so much light pollution. So I remember, I remember we we have that little dome set up in the gym sometimes, and they show us the constellations. And then I go try to find them at night, and I'm like, I can't see anything. And so I've never been that good with the constellations, so I'm always happy that I can actually find the Big Dipper. Nice. <laughs> which, is, which is probably a, a, a kind of lame answer for anyone that's actually an a enthusiast of astronomy, but. <laughs> sometimes the simple answer is the good answer, right? Yeah. And then um, it's my, my Anna Lane, 
loves that I'm uh, speaking to an astronaut, and it's uh, about to be her birthday. So happy birthday, Anna! Happy she birthday. wants to know. Ah, oh, thank you very much. She's she's gonna love that. Um, she wants to know what personal characteristic of yours do you think has helped you the most in um becoming an astronaut? Hi. Wow, that's a good one. Um. I think I'd say resilience. Um, to me, that is one of the most important characteristics after integrity. And so I think any anyone that wants to achieve something that, I don't know, that that is great, they're going to encounter failures, they're going to encounter setbacks. Like, there's no question. That's not like a hundred percent you will if you're doing something that's that's pushing you to your limit you're going to have failures and so without that resilience to get back up and say i'm i'm gonna keep trying i'm gonna keep going you're, you're not gonna get there i agree with that and i think that in life that is the most important thing and like you said, you hear people, oh, Jasmine's a, an astronaut and this guy's a fighter and Mark's a rock star and Sean's a rock and like all these different things. But they don't see like people playing the no shows or failing math tests or, you know, fighters getting beat up in the gym or not making weight. And that road to like your dreams, is it's doing that. It's never just that easy, straight path. And I think that's why a, a lot of the I always feel like I'm, I'm just reading off of one of those um, like Tony Robbins boards in somebody's office with all like the cheesy cliche things. But. All that stuff about knowing what your why is and and pushing through and not giving up, it, it really is where I think success comes from. And I think that resiliency comes again from having the desire. So you have to really want something and, and decide that you want it and, and make your mind up that you're going to do this no matter what. Because if you don't and you don't make that mental commitment to it, you are going to tap out when you hit that adversity and you're not going to have that tenacity and that resilience to, to keep going when it gets hard, you're going to go to the next thing that seems easier. And that, that's what I see a lot of people do. I want to be an astronaut. Okay. Oh, you know what? It's getting kind of hard. Forget it. I'll just go do something else. And then that gets, oh, you know what? I'll go do something else. And people don't want to put the time in to commit. So I think the fact that you've made your mind up and committed towards your goals and just not taking no for an answer as basic as that sounds, it, is sounding like that's a hundred percent of the reason why you got where you are. Yeah, anything you do, like it's it's going to take that constant effort and constant dedication. And sometimes it's gonna be fun and sometimes it's not gonna be as fun. Like I'm I'm sure how how much does Sean practice the base to be like a you know lead basis for taking back Sunday? I'm sure every day. I mean I know he was doing it from when we were kids, right? So he you just don't you're absolutely right you don't get there without that like consistent uh, dedication and effort and hopefully more often than not it's fun and enjoyable but there are definitely gonna be times where it's gonna be difficult and a bit painful yeah my uh, my buddy Aljamain sterling is a ufc fighter and he had this uh, shirt that says it's what i do when no one's watching and i always thought that that was the coolest shirt because you know people see him on tv and he's doing all this great stuff but he knows that if the guy he's fighting is getting up at five, he's getting up at four. And like, it's going right. to make him think when people aren't watching him, he's doing his push ups, he's running, he's watching his meals, like he's doing all the things in the background that count so we can do those other things. And um, again, I'm sure your whole life you've done things in the background that people didn't see to get you where you are today, just like everybody didn't watch Mark and Sean practice in their basement every day. Like, I watched my brother play drums every day of his life. I watched, you know, yeah. Kabe go study every single day and you know that's what it takes it's it's that that course of action of just staying consistent with something I, I think is amazing so um when you go through these things I know you talk a little bit about how you handle some of the challenges and I thought that was a great answer but when you get stressed out what is your what is your release what is your go-to you know for me it's like obviously jujitsu and, and fast food are my two go-tos when I'm feeling stressed out but what do you do um to handle pressure when you're when you need to stay calm on a mission or when you're just home and you need to just blow off some steam at home to just shut that brain off for a little bit? Yeah, so try different answers for those different questions. So, you know, when I'm at home and I need to de-stress, um, what, like water sports are big kind of for me. Um, out here, um, Sam and I, my husband and I go paddle boarding a lot. That's a, being out on the water is something that just 
I think I've always really enjoyed. That's a big one for me. Um, playing music, um, just practicing on various instruments is something that I definitely do. Dancing, I love dancing. I've always loved dancing since I was a kid. I've never, I've never done it in any sort of formal manner really, but um, I've always enjoyed it. So those are kind of things I like to do to de-stress. In terms of like staying calm during, you know, a professional situation or a, a mission or something like that when things get stressful. I think, I think it's, it's what you actually do beforehand that preps you for that. You know, for example, like in the, in the Marine Corps flying Cobras on deployment, um, things are constantly changing, right? You go out thinking you're going to fly one mission in Afghanistan and you get diverted to support somewhere else. And the ability to adapt to that is just from the, the preparation and the training beforehand, you know, you think through any contingency situations you can in your head beforehand. You prep so that things are muscle memory, so the aircraft systems are muscle memory, and that gives you that ability to um, handle those stressful sh situations. Was there, um, obviously, I I'd love to hear about the training and stuff you guys do. So, you know, one of the things people ask me sometimes is they're like, oh, you know, I see you box, but I don't want to box because I don't like getting hit in the face. And I'm like, well, I mean, you start to learn how to how to not get hit in the face. That's the whole point. But I remember the very first time I went in there thinking, like, how how hard could this really be? I watch people fight on TV, and I get hit by an actual boxer, and it was the worst. And the mental panic that went into me of like, I have to get out of here. I'm never coming back. And then as time went on, more and more frightened to go back because now I knew what to actually expect. But I started being able to get hit, and then I would get hit, and instead of freaking out. I was able to really stay calm and breathe and assess the situation. And then I started finding that when that adrenaline would kick in in normal situations, everybody else would freak out, but my body would actually stay calm and I was able to stay rational. And then you hear about things like that, that police and, and like military people that have never been in confrontation and then they lose it and they do crazy stuff because they're not trained to keep their mind and body calm. That the stakes on what you're doing are so much higher so how did you prep to be able to stay calm in tough situations? Because I'm sure it didn't start like that. There's probably those those times like my friends that are firefighters that they're like, the first time I actually went into a house that was on fire, I was like, I have no business being in here. What the hell am I doing? Yeah, you know, uh, you talking through that story reminded me of, um, so we have to do this um, water survival qualification in uh, as an aviator in the Marine Corps. And, you know, you have to recertify every few years for it. And part of it is you're in this, it's like a simulated helicopter and you get dunked in the water, flipped, and then you have to get out and you potentially have to push out a window, you know, pass over some other people and, and get out of the situation. And sometimes you do it blindfolded, you know, you have these blacked out goggles. And... You know, the first time I did it, I didn't know what to expect. Kind of like you said, I was like, how bad can it be, you know? But then one time my vest got stuck and I was, I had the blacked out goggles on and my vest got caught on something in the, in the cabin. And so I'm like doing everything right. I'm holding my position, opening my belts, doing the hand over hand so I don't, you know, lose my awareness of where I am. And suddenly I realize I'm stuck. And at first I like, at first I stayed calm. I was like, the training says, you know, maintain my reference point and try to, you know, I'll use my other hand. And then I couldn't, I couldn't get unstuck. And then I went to panic. I was like, I need to get out of here. Like, there's only so long I can hold my breath. And I remember I was just like pulling on the thing. And I'm sure I was only underwater for the span of a minute. But in that minute, my like emotions went from calm to panic. And then I was I, w I got collected myself and said, listen, Jasmine, you just need to get yourself unstuck. You know, g getting all worked up about it, it doesn't help anything, right, to, to lose your cool. And so I calmed myself back down, got myself unstuck. And anyway, I obviously survived the situation. But, but it is crazy, those situations when um, you're just not prepared for them and they catch you off guard. 
I think um, part of it is, I think the training is huge um, to, to help you calm down in those situations. But I do think the more, kind of like you said, the more you're exposed to them and you know how you're going to react in those situations and you learn how to kind of adapt your reaction and um, kind of change your frame of mind on it, it, it helps kind of train you to handle those situations. So what was um, one of the scariest times that you've had in your training or, or in your career? What's what's one of the situations that I'm sure there's limited things that you can actually say, but just something that comes to mind. And that, that might have been probably a great one right there, which leads right into the question of just something during training that you remember is something that was a, just a scary, scary time in your life to keep you keep calm under pressure. Yeah, like actually physically scary. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, there are a couple. Um, let's see. The, I think I think one of the scariest was um, I was in I was in Afghanistan flying. It was a low light level night. So, you know, we're in the night vision goggles, um, but the, the illumination was just really low. And it was a long night because we were um, we had to go out several times uh, on multiple flights and we we're kind of in this the the terrain was a bit bold around us so normally you know you, you don't want to do excessive maneuvering at night but we we had to kind of do some to stay within this terrain and i started to get vertigo which i hadn't really experienced before and i remember i just I started to vocalize it to the other, you know, because we fly with two in the Cobra. I started to vocalize it to the other pilot. Um, but at that point, I was able to recognize it and still fly the aircraft. But then it, it progressively got worse to the point where um, it just, I was so thrown off that I was having a hard time, you know, keeping the aircraft in a, in a level configuration. And I, I had to give the other, give the other pilot the controls. And, you know, I just, I, cause I remember I ended up kind of in a descent, but every time I pull back, it kind of threw me off. And so I ended up giving the other pilot the controls and it, and it took me a while to, to get back out of it and be able to fly the aircraft again. And I just remember thinking that was so scary because I'd never, I'd never felt that feeling where I actually physically cannot make myself do what I need to do because it's my vestibular system was so off. Man, that's crazy. I'm blown away with your emotional intelligence and mental toughness. It's it's really incredible. <laughs> Thank you. It's awesome. So uh, another question I got was, what was your first experience without gravity? And can you describe it? Yeah, so obviously I haven't been to space yet. So, but we do do, we do training in these, um, we do these parabolic flights basically. So I want to say for about, 15, 20 seconds at a time, you get that feeling of weightlessness. Um, and the the most interesting thing to me was just the tiniest, the tiniest force. You just you just have a tendency because we're used to being on Earth with the, you know, and feeling the weight of everything. You don't get used to how tiny a force is needed when you're in that weightlessness. You just touch something and that's going to move you. And so I, I had a tendency initially, we're all kind of flailing around a bit, trying to get our bearings of, you know, how little you need to do something to move and, and to get yourself in this completely steady state. You really just had to just hold on to something, neutralize everything and then let go. And it and it takes a, it took a little while to get used to. I mean, I'm sure if you, you know, got to spend a whole day eventually when I actually go to space and you probably adapt to it pretty quickly, but um, it was definitely interesting. I, I felt like I was flailing around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So what can you bring with you? Are you able to bring music or your favorite snacks and, uh, and, and what's on the agenda for what you're gonna do? Do you, do you know what your mission is or what your roles are gonna be at? No, I don't know yet. So our class just graduated in January um, so I haven't been assigned to a mission yet. So in the meantime, we, we continue training, always training. And then we work, they're called uh, like technical duty. So it's, it's like a, a ground job. So I 
I work right now um, in the exploration branch on uh, stuff for the next lunar lander. But in the meantime, just training. So I don't know what mission I'll be on yet. Um, and what, sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> Can you bring stuff? Are you are you able to bring food or music? Uh, I mean, I guess you can't pack your guitar, but you know. Yeah, you can you can bring a, a small amount of stuff. I don't remember the exact, uh, and it, it'll depend on what mission you're on. But photos, I'm I'm a big photo person, so you know when when I was deployed, I always had this little uh, it was like wallet size photo album, pictures of my parents, my brother, and stuff. And so I'm big on photos. I'll definitely bring photos, music. I, Music is huge for me, so definitely music. Um, and I don't know, maybe maybe some um, little like memorabilia from, you know, the Marine Corps and different units I've been in and different stuff that that has personal meaning to me. Um, That's cool. What's what are some potential times for how long you you would be away for? Yeah. So right now. Um, you know, like Christina Cook just came back. She was up uh, on the International Space Station for almost a year. So um, we're definitely doing long duration stuff on the order. Six months to a year is uh, not at all abnormal. And then um, eventually we'll be talking about uh, hopefully going to Mars. And so once we get to that point, it would be on the order of years. So, you know, two and a half, three years potentially for missions. So. Um, but right now, still focusing on the International Space Station, and we're looking to get back to the moon uh, in 2024. So those missions would be on the order of uh, months to for the space station, potentially up to about a year or so. Man, that's incredible. Well, they are going to have to really do something big for your internet connection so you can get Tiger King up there. <laughs> I already watched the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get Netflix on the moon, but uh, but how do you do? How do you contact? Are you just completely only into contact with the base there? Is there ways that you can send? I mean, I I literally have no idea. It might be the most ridiculous question of, is there a way to send like a message or an email? Or I I have no idea. I've watched a lot of movies, but I don't no, think those are realistic. It's not it's not ridiculous at all. So on the on the space station. So we've been up at the space station having it manned for um, close to twenty years now. So. The, on the space station, we've got pretty good uh, communication established. Um, the astronauts will about once a week do video chats with their families. Um, we have, you know, obviously the normal voice loops between mission control and the station. And there definitely, we have periods of time where uh, we lose that connection, but we've gotten to a point where we're pretty good. Um, and most of the time we have a connection and we'll only use lose it for a few minutes here and there. Um, and yeah, they'll, they'll send up, uh, you know, if they request certain news or magazines or certain things, we'll send those up. And um, I think we'll send up some videos and stuff like that, some movies, so. That's really cool, man. Technology is just amazing. It is, right? Yeah, it's really cool. Again, it goes back to why I love smart people. All the things that everybody enjoys every day came from somebody who's super intelligent that figured out how to do this stuff. So I think it's cool. So um, obviously you um, you like some of the artistic stuff. So you said you watched Tiger King. I'm, I'm always interested. Um, first, on the military side and also on the space side, um, you know, I, I've had a reference point for people who tell me some of the shows or some of the movies that are most realistic or most ridiculous for actually being a Marine, but I've never had somebody that can tell me from the astronaut side of it. So on the on the military side, what are some of your favorite movies that you feel are most closely resembling what the experience is like? And on the astronaut side, is there anything that even is somewhat realistic or, or resembles at all, like the training part of it at least? Man, this is, I'm like probably the worst person you could ask this question because <laughs> I, like for the space side, I, everyone, everyone always shakes their head when I say this. I'm not super into sci-fi movies actually. So, um, oh, you're breaking people's uh, hearts all I over know. the country. <laughs> I know I am. Um, it's horrible. I should, I should just like train myself or something, but, <laughs> but, but I will say one of my favorite space movies is Apollo 13. Um, one, I love Tom Hanks, but two, 
um, that pretty accurately tells an incredible story of, I think, teamwork and what people can do, like the just the power of people coming together in a focused way um, with an obviously incredibly important mission. I mean, people's lives were uh, very seriously on the line and overcoming that and with a lot of time pressure. So Apollo 13 is probably my favorite space movie. Um, oh, military movies, that's a tough one. Uh, I will, I won't put you on the spot with it. Apollo 13 was a great reference. That was a good yeah. one. And I, I actually just asked Tom Hanks to be on my podcast. I don't know if it actually went to him. But you know what? If, if you can go to the moon, I can get Tom Hanks to come on. I figure the worst will say is no. Um, but that's really cool. Let me see what some of the other things I got here. So free time we talked a little bit about. So you obviously have achieved a lot already. Your bucket list is a dream list of things that people will, will probably never actually achieve. So being that you've already done all these amazing things and you're going, you're on your path to do all these amazing things, what other goals and stuff and things do you have? Like what what's on the bucket list of somebody who's probably gonna go to Mars? Yeah, I mean, so actually getting to space is definitely on there. I, you know, um getting a lot closer, but I, I still haven't been up there. So that's definitely on there. Um, I think um, personally, there are probably some uh, some travel spots um, I'd like to go to. Um, you know, not on the professional side, but just places I'd like to travel to. Um, you know, I I haven't spent that much time in Africa, so I'd love to do that. Um, so that's definitely on there. In terms of in terms of professionally, right now my main focus is um, someday getting to space. I I love working at NASA, and legitimately, I think if they told me for some reason I would never make it to space, I still love this job and and uh, love the people I'm working with. But obviously, it's been a dream of mine to get to space, so I want to do that. I I don't know what what else professionally, you know. Right now, that's my my horizon. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, Mark O'Connell's dad, uh, Frank O'Connell, greatest guy, such a nice guy. But he um, he goes to Africa a lot for stuff. He spends a lot of time over there for he, all kinds of different things. So he might be a good contact to give you the, the lay of the nice. land. But it's is, is it boring now to be like, oh, I'm going to jump on a plane and go to Florida? It's like... <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I've like always been strongly driven... Um, you know, when you ask about like the bucket list, I, I've never really made a bucket list because I've always been pretty driven by the people I'm doing things with. Like to me, that's not that it doesn't matter what I'm doing, but it, it's more important to me who I'm doing it with. So um, I think that's one of the reasons I'm pretty open to doing different things and trying, trying different things. But it, it's a matter of like, who am I doing that with? And luckily, I have uh, a lot of friends that do a lot of incredible things and like doing cool stuff. So it works out. That's really cool. Now, is your is your I know you don't know much about your mission, but I know you were part of an all female class, right? Um, for the astronaut corps? Yeah. No. So we had six, uh, six women and seven men. Okay. In our class. Um, two, uh, two were Canadian and then uh, the other 11 with NASA. Yeah, I forget the number offhand, but I know my um, my partner, Nicole, she was sending me like all these stats of like, do you see that the percentage of her, like not only achieving this, but achieving this as a woman and achieving like all these things, it was like a, a point something, something, something percent and you did it. And I forget, I should have had it up there. I have all these notes, but do you remember the amount of people that they actually looked through? to narrow it down to you and a couple other people. I, I remember the number was amazing. Yeah, it was over um, 18,000 that applied for our class. So yeah, I know, I think about that too. And every day I wake up very thankful to be here because when I, going through the selection process, you know, you, you interview with some of the other people as well and you get to know them and spend time with them. And I remember thinking, wow, this has been an incredible experience. Like I'm definitely not gonna get it because look at these other people, 
Um, and so the, the fact that I'm even here is extremely, uh, I feel very grateful for that because any one of those other people I think would have been just as good if not better, so. It shows, you, you look extremely happy, you look very content and I think, uh, you know, the fact that you're enjoying the whole process is is probably part of the reason why you were made for that. You know, it seems like it was, you know, I talked to a couple people recently, um, so one guy, JT Torres, he's like the number one uh, jiu-jitsu guy in the world. And I started reading off all of the titles he won. And I was like, does that feel weird? He's like, it doesn't really feel weird. It feels like that's what it was supposed to be. And I yeah. feel like you're a little bit the same of, this doesn't look like a surprise to you. You look like this was, yeah, well, like this was what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah, man, I mean, I definitely love it. It's, it's, uh, it's everything I could have dreamed of and more. I'll say that. That's really cool. Um, if you weren't working for NASA right now, what do you think you would be doing with your life? Um, I, well, I mean, I was and still am in the Marine Corps, so I, um, it'd be likely that I'd still be in the Marine Corps and, uh, either with a squadron somewhere, um, or in, uh, doing test pilot work. If I got out of the Marine Corps, um, pr probably working in the aerospace industry somewhere, I think. That's cool. Nice. Now, what's one of the, what's one of the most important lessons you've learned through this entire process? Ooh. Um, the most, there are a lot. So let me think. What? What do I want to say is the most important? <laughs> top, top, five, top five, top ten. Um, I, I think something that personally for me was important to learn was that I belong. I think maybe, maybe because some of the fields I've been in have been so male dominated, or um, just maybe because I'm a perfectionist that notices every, you know, misstep and every mistake I make or whatever it is. Um, that is something that personally for me is always, you know, I sometimes have this feeling of, man, these people are incredible. Like, how am I here with them? And so I think reminding myself that like, there's a reason I'm here too. And there's a reason, you know, there's a reason I was in the Marine Corps and there's a reason I was a Cobra pilot. There's a reason I was a test pilot. That to me is something, and I and I think a lot of, I think a lot of people honestly struggle with that, and maybe don't don't vocalize it as much. But it's something that I personally have had to keep reminding myself, and I I think it's really important to to accept that, like I belong here. I think that that's a fantastic answer, and you again, like you obviously do, because. <laughs> You were, you were always supposed to do that, so you're, you're fulfilling your destiny. Um, last couple of things, I know they've been very generous with your time, but if you were somehow able to maybe go back in time, which who knows, maybe with everything that's happening, you will be, and you get to come across a younger you, knowing what you would know now, what advice would you give to a younger Jasmine? Yeah, I th and I think we've we've talked about some of them before, but one, surround yourself with good people. Surround yourself with people that are going to celebrate your successes, that are going to lift you up, that are going to help you, but also challenge you and, you know, let you know when you're wrong or, you know, when you've done something wrong. Um, going back to the resilience, don't give up. If something's important to you, figure out a way to do it. Get help when you need it, but but keep getting back up and keep trying. Try different things, try whatever it takes. But but if you know you want to do it, um, get, you know, you can do it. You just have to believe that yourself. I think those are those are probably some big things. Um, and then, you know, seek out mentorship. That's something I've been lucky. Like I said, I've had a lot of uh, good mentors throughout, throughout my life and my career. Seek those people out. And pe people are usually very willing to, uh, to offer their help and, and guidance. So pick out those people that you want to emulate and, and pick their brains. That's amazing. And I think that's outstanding advice. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So you are a, you know, combat tested war 
Marine, you know, you're uh, you make Long Island proud. You inspire women, girls, people, men, females, just humans all over the place. You were literally part of history. Um, I want to thank you for your military service. I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank your parents for always being so nice every time we came over there. Um, tell your brother I said hi, but I you accomplished all these things. You have, you know, a very good grounded uh, um, head on your shoulders, personally, professionally. Um, you just got married. Congratulations on that as well. I see you have a guitar and a bass in the background. So you got a lot of stuff going on. What is next? What's on the agenda? What does the next six to 12 months look like for you? Yeah, so right now I'm focused on um, the, so the human landing system, the next lunar lander, um, we're going to be announcing contracts for that soon. And so focused on working on that and how do we train for the next uh, lunar landings is something uh, I'm specifically focusing on just because of my background um, with helicopters and, and tests and stuff. So focusing on that, training is just continuous, always training. And then uh, and then I'll be, there's a, some spacewalks coming up uh, this summer that I'll be the one, we'll call it the ground IV, the person talking the people in space through the procedures. So preparing for that. So I make sure I can help the crew on board as much as possible. That's really exciting stuff. That's cool. Yeah, so lots of, lots of cool stuff going on. You really just don't do anything a little bit. Everything is like huge. It's pretty cool, but I love it. I mean, that's the exact type of person that I, I love to talk to, just people who kind of go after it and make things happen. So if if somebody was listening to this and they wanted some type of closing summary, and I mean, I could take pretty much everything you said and, and put it into this category, but somebody who's looking to achieve something right now and is maybe doubting themselves or looking to take the first steps, what would be some advice you would give if, if this was a book and what, what would your little couple paragraphs or chapter in the book be to contribute to somebody to give them some words of encouragement to achieving success? I think just reminding them that um, everyone has self-doubt. Um, everyone. I've, ne I've never in my life talked to someone that didn't go through self-doubt. I still have self-doubts. You know, when, when I got here and got in the suit for the first time in the neutral buoyancy lab to practice doing a spacewalk that the astronauts made look so easy. I, I was a complete mess at first and I was like, wow, you know, am I ever going to be able to get to that level? So, you know, everyone's going to have self doubt, but at the end of the day, um, just, I think, I think knowing that that's a normal thing and knowing, just let that be more of a driver to you to, to push harder and, um, and succeed more, but don't let it, don't let it stop you. Let it be something that kind of kind of helps you push to be better. I think that that's awesome. And, you know, I'm not only speaking for myself, but for all the people that you grew up with that I talk to back home all the time, you know, everybody's very, very happy to see you be happy and see you be successful and living out your dreams. You know, um, good people like to see good people do great things. So I love that everybody's rallying around you and they're happy for your success. And really pushing for you and rooting for you back home. Everybody has a lot of respect for you. Everybody has a lot of admiration for you and everybody has a lot of love for you. So thank you very much for letting me interview you today. I very much appreciate it. Any uh, any closing thoughts for anybody listening back home? Uh, thanks, Nick. It was great talking to you and great seeing you again. It's been a while. Um, yeah. No, just thank you. And that support from back home and all that that positive energy, it, it's incredible for me on, on the receiving end of it. So thank you to all the people for all their support. And I didn't, I didn't get here alone. I think, you know, I've stressed that throughout. I did not get here alone. So thank you to everyone, everyone back home, all the teachers uh, growing up, all the people throughout my life that have, that have helped me get here. Well, we'll be watching and we'll be rooting for you for sure. You know, I think you are absolutely amazing in everything you've done and everything you're going to do. So Thank you for uh, letting me share it with you for a little bit. I will let you go. Thank you, Jennifer, for letting me steal you for an hour. Jasmo Belly, thank you very much, and uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Thanks, Nick. It was great talking to you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.